Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of the Hilt Podcast. Tonight, I am interviewing the beautiful Kitty Rose. How are you doing, sweet girl? I'm doing good, love. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm so happy to have you this evening. Bring me on, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, girl, yes, come on. Uh-huh. <laughs> so Kitty is our relationship and intimacy expert tell us what an intimacy and relationship consultant does so a relationship consultant basically we assist in strengthening restoring reestablishing, restructuring failing or declining relationships uh we map out certain things that certain guides basically for each client that kind of can help them navigate through their relationship uh, we focus on communication skills, uh, intimate connections, conflict resolution, all of that. Uh, intimacy consultant, aka a sex coach. <laughs> I don't like calling myself a sex coach because then I feel like it focuses more on sex. Uh, so intimacy consultants, you know, we focus on basically what the target areas of uh, potential problems are in a relationship, whether it be sexual deprivation, a low sexual, a low sex drive, uh, loss of sexual desire. And so we use body uh, touch spirit to kind of help navigate through that, to kind of help reestablish that mm-hmm. intimate connection. I, as an intimacy consultant, focus on four forms of intimacy, 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 the four forms of intimacy to basically reestablish that connection. Okay. We introduce the intimacy in a relationship and I'm big on cultivating intimacy through relationships, through love relationships. Nice. And mm-hmm. I love that you've already touched on the difference between sex and intimacy. Yeah. They are not the same thing. So, <laughs> right. I'm so glad that you talked about that because, you know, not everybody realizes that. Not everybody knows that. Yeah. And people need to understand that sex is mostly physical. You know, it's still an art, but it still focuses more on the physical aspect of intimacy. And then you have physical, spiritual, intellectual, and emotional intimacy that you have to mm. tap into. That's where it really draws from. But people think of sex as just, you know, intercourse. And you have to focus on what that builds up to that. And in everyday life, when you don't have that physical part, what are you doing to connect again? And that's what a lot of relationships are lacking nowadays. Right, exactly. So like, does that intimacy part come in with like love languages? Yes, they all play a major factor with one another. Okay. They all play a major factor with one another. You have uh, quality time, which is that can act as emotional and well, quality time can act as emotional and spiritual intimacy. It really can. That can be three forms of intimacy, actually. So, yes, it kind of guides the love languages kind of guide intimacy in a way they do. Okay, that's good information. I I never would have put two and two together. Well, I ain't going to say never, but like I haven't put two and two together, you know, before talking to you. That's that's actually really good information. Thank you. Thank you. So Kitty, baby, you have quite a TikTok following. I do, I do. I you do. You have quite a TikTok following and not only a TikTok following, you have a YouTube following and you have an Instagram following. But on TikTok, <laughs> you have touched on narcissism in your content. Could you talk about the traits of, cause here's the thing, and you already know, we talk about narcissistic men a lot. I was talking Could about- we for a second quick right here, right now, talk about narcissistic women and mm-hmm. how those things are playing out in the dating space right now? Oh, man, okay. Uh, we talk about gaslighting a lot with narcissistic men. Uh, But gaslighting is a big trait for narcissistic women. Narcissistic women can be very deceitful. Uh, They love triangulation. They love the competition. They love the drama between one and two, three people. They love that, that cycle. They love all of that. uh, A lot of times they're emotionally unstable. Um, Emasculation is a big joy for them. Causing pain for other people is a big joy. The number one thing that I see with narcissistic women in a dating scene is how they kind of use up people and then leave like they 
what they need to out of a person, then they start to devalue them and then they leave. And that becomes a cycle. And then there becomes a cycle of damaged people, especially men. Mm -hmm. I would say I have seen the effects of a narcissistic woman on men Same. and very detrimental. Oh my God, it's, it's actually kind of disheartening to see it a lot of times because a lot of these men can't shake back from that. You know, when he goes to hurt, it's hard for him to shake back because it takes a lot for a man to give himself to a woman. And then narcissistic women, especially in the dating game, they use sex for power. Really? Everything. Sex is their manipulation tactic. Mm -hmm. And so it, it looks sometime in a dating scene as if this woman really does like me, but that's not the case. They just get you, they use you for what they can. If I have to play like I'm best, like I said in my video, if I have to play like I'm the best stepmother in the world to get your attention, to get what I need out of you, I'm going to play that. Even if it is, I don't like kids. If wow. you try to leave me and I know that your natural instinct is sex as a man, mm -hmm. I feel like you would just that to get what it is that I need because narcissistic women are selfish. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that narcissism is just insidious. Like sometimes we don't recognize it when it's happening, but, you know, shout out to people like you um, and other dating coaches who are <laughs> shedding light on what these things look like. Um, and I just feel like that narcissism is like kind of running rampant in pop culture now. I feel like it's, we hear it in our music. I feel like we hear it on these trending videos on TikTok and the otherwise, like talk about that for a second. That's a big thing. And that's why I'm really big on the music that you invite into your relationship and you invite into your space. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because what typically tends to happen is that you listen to this music and it's all about a downplay on relationship. It's, it's female empowerment by breaking down men. And so- yeah. Yeah, and so a lot of people get into these relationships, they listen to this poison and they're like, okay, well, I know what I can get out of you and this is all that I need out of you, especially in dating, but that, that's not the case. We're looking for longevity, but the music is teaching you how from person to person. It's teaching you get what you need and move on to the next person. Build yourself up off of this person and move on to the next person. Mm -hmm. That Brittany uh, Renner effect. <clears throat> oh, the tea of it all. And then here's, here's the real tea. I love the city girls. I love Meg. Not them being in whole relationships while they like encouraging people to do this stuff. Come on now, y'all. Come on. Yeah, they in whole relationships. We don't know if these relationships are healthy, unhealthy. We don't oh. know if public uh stunt. We don't know exactly what it is, but those are I, I love Meg as well. But you know, if it sells to be hypocritical, that's what they're gonna do, right? no matter how much poison it is that you feel you feeding into the youth as long as that's, that's a good point it sells music it yeah. sells music yeah. so speaking of things that are running rampant on social media mm -hmm. there's like three major conversations going on <laughs> about relationships with men specifically uh -huh. one of which is being this man's peace mm -hmm. first of all my head already hurt talking about that because like <laughs> what does it even mean like what does that even mean when your man is asking you to be his peace in the relationship how does this happen and how do we even start to talk about that okay so um what I will say is when a man has to ask for peace, there is some type of concern. There's something that needs to be raised, okay? Sometimes it can be a woman that specifically just to throw on his peace just by picking fights or being hormonal or uh, just from this projecting her childhood traumas, not being able to resolve conflict. Sometimes that can be the case. Mm -hmm. Other times it can be a man who just is creating chaos as mm -hmm. I and you know my controversial video a man who has created chaos and he's asking for peace you have no right to ask for peace if you've created chaos and disturbed someone else's peace you can't ask for it but typically men who are not doing this who may just be getting the short end of the stick from problems within their house they're looking for a place to basically rejuvenate their mind body and soul that's basically what they're doing they're trying to rejuvenate their spirit they're trying to find a calm safe haven to relinquish all of these worldly concerns that they have you know, they don't want to come into uh, a home or a house or come to their partner who's 
talking about talking to them about all of these uh, trivialities or gossip or anything like that. They're not trying to do that. They just want a quiet place almost. Right. Enough. You know? Right. So I think when men ask for peace, that's exactly what they're looking for. But it's certain men who ask for peace that create the problem. So if he's asking you for peace and you're the problem, that's different. This is what he's saying. I'm just needing a calm place right now. Okay. Mm -hmm out of all the stuff that I just dealt with here out of all the stuff that I am going through in my life I just need to be able to energize myself again to rejuvenate myself with you as, right. as my safe haven but like I said the ones who are doing everything else you know lying cheating manipulation being deceitful mm -hmm. deceptive, no they, they don't have the right to ask for that peace when you're creating a piece, if you come into the household and if you can't bring your phone in the house, if you have to put your phone on silent, if you have to hide messages or everything like that, you can't ask for peace. Child. No, you can't. So that's what I feel. You know, society likes to talk about asking for peace. Well, why do we have to ask for peace? Because if you're bringing the peace into a relationship, what are you asking mm -hmm. for? And see, that's, I feel like that's the, the very important part of the message that gets skipped over mm -hmm. way too much. What and it's it like it kind of puts me in the mind frame of like if somebody go through your phone and they mad, like why would you you know what I'm saying? Like, why would you be concerned about me going through your phone and being upset if there was nothing in your phone for me to be upset about? Right. And you know, I'm really big on saying saying that uh, I still believe in a hierarchy. I still believe in a hierarchy in a relationship. I still believe that men do establish the relationship. I still believe that. Men are men should be a guide in the relationship. I should be able as a woman to trust you to navigate this relationship. I'm here, full support. I'm still here for you, but I need to know that you can lead this relationship wisely, okay? Mm -hmm. Doing all of this stuff that's gonna traumatize a relationship or, or threaten our relationship, you're not leading me the right way. So mm -hmm. if and if you're not putting peace into this relationship, we won't have a peaceful foundation. We won't have it. It won't be here. Right. Exactly. It not be peaceful at all. So in, in my eyes, a lot of times when men talk about this, I'm always going to ask them, what are you doing to establish that peace though? I need to know. Let's start here. What are you doing to establish this peace? And then if you and her can admit that it's not you and it's her, then we will address this. But it's way too common that I see men say, I just want peace. That I hear that so much when I ask, what is it that you are lacking in a relationship? What do you want? Peace. Well, peace, peace be still because you ain't, <laughs> you, know, you ain't doing what it takes to have peace in your relationship. Right. And I, and I, like, I personally like experienced that as well. A man requesting peace from me however he's created turmoil in my life yes. and so every action has an equal and opposite reaction we know this to be a fact mm -hmm. when you create that turmoil mm -hmm. you ain't gonna get like you can't squeeze an orange and expect apple juice to come out okay well then there we are right now okay there we are that's okay what what we need it. <laughs> is all I'm saying is all I'm saying you cannot squeeze no orange and expect apple juice to come out so yeah. if you if you sitting out here like doing all this stuff to you know disrupt your peace in your relationship please don't expect for peace to be the sum of all its parts that's right that's right, that's right. absolutely it's not gonna be able to happen mm -mm. It's not. And, and, and I'm so glad that you, I'm so glad that you touch on that. And you, you talk about how you hold both men and women accountable in this dating space and in your practice. And, you know, I think that's important. Um, we both have accountability. Both sides have accountability that we have to take, you know, in dating. But yeah. I'm wondering, like, what is your best advice for black women in the dating space? Like, what are some truths that we aren't willing to accept? Uh, let's see. Um, for black women, black women, a lot of times try to conform to society's perspective of them. Okay. And we have to remove those stereotypes. Okay. Black women are hard to date. Black women are angry. Black women are defiant. 
black women have attitudinal problems. Black women have sarcastic mouths or we have to remove that. When, whenever I look at dating and I help people who are dating, I always tell them to remove the identifiers, okay? Remove the race, mm -hmm. remove the orientation, remove all of that and see yourself as one unique individual and the next person as a unique individual because it's big on, oh, black shouldn't be dating outside of the race or interracial is not this, no, remove the identifiers. Who are you outside of being a black woman? Okay. Who are you? You are a woman. We know that, but you are an individual who offers what? Mm. What do you offer yourself? So when, if it comes to women, especially with black women, when it comes to dating or anything like that, that's my biggest advice is to remove the identifiers. See yourself as just an individual, a unique individual, and see the person that you are dating as a unique individual. Don't conform to these stereotypes and these this perspective that society gives you. You don't have to be this loud, crazed woman. You don't have to be this attitudinal woman. You don't have to sit here and just focus on the fact that you're Black and you have something to prove. Don't do that. Don't do that to yourself because it, it hinders you from being or creating what it is that you truly are destined to have or mm. truly are destined to be. That's what my thing is with anybody that I help with dating. That's, That's such an interesting perspective that you don't hear that often. Mm -hmm. um, that like that very cut and dry, like you don't have to be. And I talk about that as well. Like black women are not a monolith what? under any circumstance. What? We're not a monolith. We the, we have so many wonderful facets. Like we're not just one way. And yes. like you said, society loves to portray black women a certain way. Yes. Social yes. media loves to portray black women a certain way. And I just want to say this out loud. Social media is fake, is extremely fake. Like it's, yes. this stuff is not real. It's not. These opinions that you be seeing like flooding Twitter not everybody thinks like that. I'm like, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but like, Social not everybody thinks like that. A smoke screen, okay? Mm -hmm. Media is, it, it's an illusion. It, it, it's supposed to, each person who posts on social media, they're supposed to convey that they convey a certain message. My life is outstanding. My relationship is outstanding. I am an influencer. I should be motivational to you. No, 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 no. These people go through the same problems that you go through and they may go through problems that are worse. Just because you see them smiling doesn't mean that their relationship is ideal. We see a lot of celebrity, the couples that smile and go on these lavish, you know, vacations. And then a week later, they're broken up the t of it all yes yes so i'm and that's another thing when i i hear god especially with my younger couples you know oh well this relation we want to be like this person and we want to be like russell wilson and sierra we uh, have baby what it is that they go through and until you stop idolizing these people and stop trying to structure your relationship based off of what you see what the idea of them may be your relationship won't be successful because mm -hmm. your relationship is trying to mirror somebody else's relationship. But how can you mirror, how can the inside, the inner aspects of your relationship mirror an outside? It's impossible to do. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way at all. I've been guilty of that, Kitty. Like I've been guilty of saying, and you know what? I'm always very specific when I say that. I'll always say, I would love to have what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So like, I want, I want that, but I want the real version of that. Like, I don't want, I don't want the social media, like PR press version of like, you know, Steph Curry and Aisha Curry, honey. And we don't even know how they doing anyway, but <laughs> You basically want, basically, I, I think this is what I'm, I'm taking from you. The love tokens that you see, the love acts that you see, the acts of appreciation, the acts of gratitude that they display, you want that. That's what you want from your partner. And that's okay to want that. That's fine. We do want the positives. Right. You want to have an optimistic outlook on what a relationship can be. Mm -hmm. And nothing wrong with that it's just we just have to be realistic to know that there are still things behind closed doors that we don't see exactly be able to make that differentiation like it ain't it ain't all bells and whistles baby like it's it's some stuff going on because they're still human at the end of the day like let's not forget that yeah. they're whole humans 
when when I was coming up, my grandfather was a, a major influence for me, major influence. And he used to always, where Rose came from, where everyone hears Kitty Rose, he used to always tell me there was a cornfield we used to pass by whenever we would go to the country, right? Like a little maize field or whatever. And he would stop right there and I would look at him and, you know, I'd just be fascinated with what I would see all the time. But he used to always tell me, you're a rose in a cornfield. And that means that I was rare amongst everything else that looks identical. But even still with a cornfield, the corn on the outside looks identical, but in the inside, each piece of it is different, okay? On. What we can see is the outside. So amongst all these things that look identical, I used to take that when I got older, I started thinking a different way from what I knew when I was younger. Mm -hmm. All these things that look great. I'm a unique individual here and I stand out, right? So I use that story for everyone that I work with. See yourself as that unique individual. So see your relationship as in its own uniqueness mm -hmm. for what it is. See it for that. That's why I'm, I'm really big on people not trying to, you know, conform to the ideas. Mm -mm. I love that so much. You are a rose <laughs> in a cornfield, baby. Like, I just want you to know I've adopted that now. Like that's, <laughs> that's a me and you thing at this point. Like, cause I love that. That's one, a rose in the corn. Did y'all hear that? A rose in the cornfield. Shout out to my papa. Rest in peace. Come on, papa. Come on, papa. I have a papa too. <laughs> I call him Popeye as well. So listen, my love, in one of your most popular videos on TikTok, you address how sometimes women can perceive themselves as non-toxic, but truly be pouring toxicity into the relationship. Could you expound on this? How do we do, how do we be doing that? And most importantly, how do we stop doing that? A lot of women suffer from <laughs> a lot of women suffer from the princess syndrome and the hero syndrome. Ooh. Two syndromes from, okay? The princess syndrome, if you think of a princess as a spoiled brat, right? Mm -hmm. Gotta have their way. When they don't have their way, what are they doing? They're throwing tantrums. They're throwing a fit. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they're bossy. They have this jealous spirit about themselves. Uh, they're indecisive. Um, just those kind of things. We So a lot of women have this princess syndrome. They go into a relationship and that is very unhealthy. I really don't like the term toxic. I try not to use it as much, okay. but it's a very unhealthy you know, characteristic to have, okay? So they go into these relationships and the moment that maybe their partner stands up against them or maybe their partner tells them no, or maybe their partner stands their ground or puts their foot down, it becomes an issue. And then it becomes the verbal attacks, the character attacks, the emotional attacks. And when that happens, that makes you unhealthy to the foundation of your relationship. You're pounding at the foundation and breaking the foundation of your relationship constantly. So when that round, when that foundation breaks completely, and you have nothing all the way down, you're at fault. And a lot of women don't understand that you can be that person to do that. You can have an outstanding relationship, but because you were told no so many times in your childhood, you don't want to hear it from this person. Ooh. All of these childhood traumas into your relationship, that makes you unhealthy. You're picking these fights for what? Because someone didn't agree. Oh, and another a, a really big thing uh, that I see with this princess syndrome is they see all, cri all criticism as negative criticism. And that's not the case. Some of the criticism is constructive. Mm -hmm. to help you become a better person for yourself and for the relationship mm -hmm. and anytime you say anything to them there's the attacks that come with it there's the fighting that comes with that there's that uh debacle that comes it's just so much that comes with the princess syndrome that's one thing and then you have the women who have the hero syndrome okay mm -hmm. and this hero syndrome is you want this person to save you you are looking for a hero save you from your past you want someone to save you from your problems whether they are or the past or the present you're constantly needing someone to fix the things the problems that you have the things that you should have addressed prior to the relationship and these women are the ones who typically attract the narcissistic men because most narcissistic men have the hero complex they want to do all that they can to save you to make you look hey i want to save the damsel in distress because if i save this damsel in distress i'm gonna get everything that i need out of her she going to see me as the person that she needs. I'm going to become her security blanket. And people don't really shy away from their security blankets. Little babies, whenever they have their little favorite little blankie, they gravitate to it all the time. It gives them peace. It helps them sleep at night. It gives them a little bit of comfort. That hero syndrome and hero complex go hand in hand. 
So women who suffer from that draw narcissistic men in. And the princesses, they draw narcissistic men in too as well. But then you also have these princesses who portray to have their things together. They get these great, wonderful, healthy relationships and they ruin it by their mouths and their attitudes, not being able to control their attitudes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I kind of you just read me for filth because like I definitely have been on the princess side and I definitely have been on the hero side. Like without even realizing that that's what was going on like before I started my healing journey I didn't really realize how I showed up in relationships and how the things that I was putting out was was attracting a certain type of partner you know and so girl I was just read for filth like thank god for therapy I'm just saying because like that therapy will really start to put things in perspective for you and like that really just, it really just goes to show you have to want to identify the things that you're doing. Yeah. You have to want to identify the things that you're doing and how they are impacting you. Like if you want to build a better relationship, yeah. that better relationship starts with you, does it not? You know what? It starts with you. And I can honestly say from what I have seen from doing this work, from doing, mm-hmm. doing work within my own business, what I have seen is a lot of people uh, conform to their relationship and their partners, right? Mm. And a lot of people, what they typically tend to do with their relationships is they focus so much on the wrongs of another person and not their self. They lose themselves within that relationship. They don't have their self-happiness. Uh, they don't have self-compassion. They don't have self-love. Their self-worth is low. They have lost themselves within a relationship. They have lost themselves within a partner. And whenever they come in, folks, and I, oh, I want to fix this relationship. And I always said, we have to fix you first. And they always get upset about it. Well, I want this. Yeah, but how can I fix this relationship if the two big people that's building the relationship are ill? How can I fix this? You don't have the strength to give this relationship right now. Mm-hmm. So how can I fix this right here that you are both trying to put together if I have you weak and you're not able to stand because you have been trying to put everything into this partner and this partner has been taking everything away from you. Where's the balance? The That's tea of it all. It's not going to work. It's not. So until people realize that it starts with self, mm-hmm. it starts with self. They will never get anywhere. That's never. so true. It's giving love Dorsey. You know who love Dorsey is? You like love. <laughs> It's giving love. Okay. Well, listen, how long have you been in this profession and what inspired you to pursue this line of work? So I have decided to actually come for it now for about a year. And before that, I was doing shadow work for a while. When I say I was doing shadow work, I was not ready to actually put out my exercises. I wasn't actually ready to come out and tell y'all who kitty actually was i wasn't ready to do it so people will reach out to me on certain on certain social media platforms and be like hey kitty i need help with this relationship because on facebook i would always make lives and stuff and i would do this behind the scenes this is everything that i was doing but i had to make sure that my exercises could work before i actually put them out there i had to make sure that everything that i was doing especially with couples because i started off with couples Mm -hmm. i had to make sure that my stuff was working. I didn't have enough courage to actually come out and do anything. I was like, nah, I just do it behind closed doors. But then I said, you know what? The world needs to see these, these exercises. This can help these people. Once I saw how successful they were. So yeah, yeah. officially with a year, within a year. <laughs> I agree. I like, I love that. I love that. Like you had to do, you had to study before you, you know, launched and that was smart. That was smart. And I, I will say, because I have been to therapists, I have worked with relationship coaches and I have seen some things didn't work. I was like, that's, yeah, I can read a book for this. It's so actually, I, actually. If you be honest about it, a lot of people, when they are looking to start their journeys, they go to Amazon or something and find a book and they start there. And I said, no, I want to make sure that what I'm doing actually works. Mm-hmm. So once I saw that it actually worked, I said, I got it now. Okay. We can bring it out. There you we go. Can- there you go. And you're all close the worst. <laughs> Listen, you did your you did your clients a huge justice by doing that as well. And you just talked about how you had to start with how you got to start with self. Yes. And that was literally you starting with self, especially you talking about shadow work. I think you did an excellent job and you're continuing to do an excellent job. Thank so you. let me give you your flowers. 
Come on, Come on. Like Thank you so much. Come on, flowers. It's a rose as well. Like, let's go ahead and give you your roses. <laughs> so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, listen, Kitty, what do you think is the biggest barrier between people and romantic relationships? And how can we work to heal those? When you ask me that question, I want to make sure I'm getting it right. People mm-hmm. with relationships or outside of relationships you said within re- romantic relationships so i think I'm, within romantic relationships barriers hmm. you know what actually let's be fair like whole time you could do both like you could do within romantic relationships and like people who are looking to have romantic relationships that are not necessarily in them. I say it's fear in both that's the biggest barrier fear it's fear in both um I'm going to go based off of what I see in my study. People can get into relationships and want to give their all to somebody, but they can't. They have the fear that this is going to fail. People don't know how to enjoy and live in the presence of now. They don't know how to enjoy the moment. They don't. They start looking at the future and start making these unrealistic expectations that sometimes kind of hinder them or kind of put, mm, kind of put a hold on them because they can't ideally realistically some of them can't even meet those expectations they put an expectation on where the relationship should be instead of really enjoying it for what it is in the present moment okay a lot of people fear is a coping mechanism right so a lot of people run away they start backing away or shying away out of fear that this relationship could possibly fail nothing's guaranteed you know Mm -hmm. maybe they have had failures in in relationships in their past where they've been through intimate relationships or love relationships with family and and probably parental relationships and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and if those things have gone sour they probably are fearful that this may go sour within a relationship so i think those are the biggest barrier in communication the fact that people don't really like to listen uh, people listen to respond. They not even respond. People listen to react. That's all it is. Ooh. That's that's really what it is. They they take a moment, take away just a quick moment. They are silent to make it seem like they're listening. And they're really just kind of reloading that verbal gun of attacks. Like as soon as you're done talking, I'm ready. Boom, boom, boom. I'm gonna hit you with these attacks. I see that a lot. I think those are really the big two barriers uh, in a relationship is fear and communication. Now, I feel like outside of the relationship is really everything that society teaches that becomes a factor. If I get into a relationship, I lose the access to everybody else. The fear of commitment. If I commit, this is going to become stagnant. It's going to become redundant. It's going to be mundane. It's, come, it's going to become a bore. When I can enjoy life out here for what it is. People don't see companionship as beautiful like it used to be as worth having anymore. I feel like that's a barrier. Or the simple fact that you're going to, sometimes people look at you and make fun. People really kind of like take influence and opinions too much to heart. So friends can say, oh man, if you get in a relationship, this is going to change. You're going to change. And they'll push away from a great relationship because of that. You know, or what would their parents think if I date this kind of person? What would my people think if I date this kind of person? What would it look like? What would my status, how would my status change? I think those are the barriers outside a relationship and the simple fact that people can't communicate outside of a relationship either a lot of people lack that as well i think those are the major i may be missing some but i think those are the major barriers that i can think of i just feel like you hit it right on the head like i for me there are three c's in relationships that's communication compromise and comprehension Mm -hmm. so it's like baby if you're not willing to communicate If you're not willing to compromise, like if you're not willing to not get what you want every single time, and if you are not willing to understand where your person is coming from, A, you ain't ready for a relationship, and B, listen, honey, like what type of relationship are you trying to build in the first place? Like if that's, if those three pillars are not met, I I completely identify with that, and especially the fear part. I just, I feel like that fear part is extremely important as well because fear can drive you to do things that you normally would not do. Mm -hmm. And I honestly feel like a lot of people must stay compromised for sacrifice. And that's not the case. They compromise is healthy. Sacrifice is unhealthy. There's a difference. There's an unhealthy boundary and there's a healthy boundary. And Uh people, people mistake that. And then people think that just by me sitting here and 
and hearing you out that I'm comprehending. No, comprehending is basically you are evaluating and analyzing this. Mm -hmm. You're taking time to break it down, to understand, to truly understand the revelations of this person's heart. Mm -hmm. That's what comprehension is for me to sit here and really truly try to understand what it is that you are saying to me I want to make sure I'm getting the message instead of just saying oh I hear you but do you did you hear the sound of my voice or did you hear the revelations of my heart there's a right. difference and so yes yeah, so you are absolutely right in that 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 is a great barrier and that is really what that's how deterioration in a relationship really does happen that's usually how it starts you're so right that's usually how it starts one or both people like there's there's that one confrontation and then that sets the precedence for the rest of the relationship if you don't want to work through it if you don't want to work on the things if you don't want to identify what you have brought and this is kitty and i'm not a relationship expert but i done been in some uh -huh. listen and so usually like what i've observed that happens is you will have two people who may or may not want to be together but more specifically their desire to want to identify that they came to the relationship with traumas they came to the relationship okay let's talk about it for a second you came to the relationship with trauma so many people want to believe that they came to the relationship and they had everything together yeah. they had everything perfect but in actuality baby not only do you have like traumas from your adult life you got your pathology from childhood that's the beauty of relationships though uh-huh the relation the great thing about a relationship is this person can be a mirror to you mm -hmm. and when i'm talking about this person can really make you see you for what it is make you see you from somebody else's eyes from an intimate level this person can tell you that hey babe you don't handle this so well why and then that's your chance to say well i wasn't able to speak when i was a child mm. i was as if i spoke i was punished for my feelings and so that's the beauty of a relationship it really can bring out the traumas and the pains that you have had now i'm not saying that i advise a person to jump into a relationship with traumas i'm not saying that i'm just saying that sometimes people can't see it from their own eyes mm -hmm. you need another set of eyes to be able to see it and a person from an intimate level knows you on a more spiritual level you know what i'm saying they see you on a deeper connection than your friends do so they can sit and say well i'm around you enough to say that you you kind of have this repetition you repeat these things this is a cycle you know, this is something that you do on a normal, something that you can actually say, you know, I didn't know that I did that. Yeah. And I know this because I have had relationships where I was able to tell people that. And I've had relationships where people are able to tell me, you know, Kitty, you do this. Do I? <laughs> then I was able to look back and say, you know what? This is one, this is one thing. And this is me just being honest and raw. If I could take this time to do that right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Uh, what I had noticed when I, in my last two relationships, I started to sit back and say, I'm looking for my father in these men. Instead Ooh. of me giving them a chance to really be my lover and being able to accept all of them, I realized that the love that I lacked from my father-daughter relationship, that first love that I was supposed to have, the abandonment that I suffered from him, each time I felt like for a minute that they could possibly leave or they would possibly abandon me, I saw what it was, that, that child, that inner child was like, no, please. No, I'm sorry, I can fix this because I didn't want to lose them how I lost my father. So I started to notice that whenever they would fail at certain things, I would punish them, I penalize them because in my mind, it's like, well, he did the same exact thing. So this is always going to be my story. And I had to stop and I had to realize I can't punish them for this failure. I can't punish them for how that relationship went with him. I started to see that. I would have never known that unless these people started voicing certain things. And it was really them telling me that like, you need to talk to your dad. I was like, you, you know what, you, you're probably right. Because I would start to see that certain things I'm like, you know what, you're doing the exact same thing. It's all right, I've dealt with this before. And I realized that was trauma. That was childhood trauma for me having a failed relationship with my father. And so then once I stepped back and I really sat back and I said, you know what, I need a little bit of help. And I finally went and saw somebody. And I was like, this is what bothers me the most. This is what hinders me the most. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm upset about. And it was a lot of the problems in a relationship with my father. And then once I healed from that and I completely cut that relationship and I caught a lot of 
a lot of flight for that. It's like, oh, you really cut your dad off? I had no choice but to, because it was best for me. Everybody was suffering because of that. I let it go. I, what I did was I acknowledged the fact that I was hurting, mm -hmm. okay? I acknowledged the fact that I did have pain from that, from that failed relationship. Then I addressed it. Now that I acknowledge it, how am I going to fix this? Once I got to that place to where I fixed it, I released it and I let it go. Mm -hmm. I cut those ties. And ever since then, I've had a great successful <laughs> journey for myself. <laughs> Listen, that's, that's the one right there. Like, well, that's, that's, that's really the one. Cause it like, it does come out as projection. Mm -hmm. And so many therapists talk about how we try to win the battle. Yeah. and other people so it's like you had that thing that happened with your father and so unconsciously you are seeking out men and they remind you of him in whatever way and you want to win that battle so last time you quote unquote lost the battle because of how that relationship played out and so now you want to win you want to conquer and that's how you that's how you end up in those fights that's how you end up in them situations that are like yeah <laughs> overwhelming and that's the thing and like we need to talk about that more we need to be more transparent about that because there's it's such a source of shame for so many people and it's like baby I just want to hug you because that's not your fault you know what I'm saying yeah. and so many people take that on to be their fault and it's not yeah, it's not absolutely yeah you are absolutely right about that I do I do advise anybody uh within their first year of a relationship if you're getting into a relationship, please go to individual counseling or therapy. I do advise that within that first year. Before you even transition into a couple's counseling, do that. I do tell couples when they first come into my coaching and consultation, I do tell them you all have to have one individual consultation and one individual session. I need to know what your backstory is. I need to know what your background is, what it is that you suffer from before I can work on you too. Because I do believe that people, it, I know a lot of people run from therapy because when people advise it, they say, oh, you're trying to make seem like I have a problem. No, it'd be beneficial for you. There's a lot of things that you probably don't even know that you are suffering from. That's very, in the, that's very you know, beneficial for you. So I believe that people should have individual couple, uh, well, individual therapy for themselves first. And then if you decide to get into a relationship, then yes, go into couples therapy within that first one or two years, because people tend to wait until they like five, six years in a relationship. And then after all these relational issues and already came up and these potential problems have already surfaced and you're at the end of the point of no return, almost to that point of no return, then you go for therapy and it's like, can you fix it now? Those patterns have already been established and they're yeah. hard to break. It's a lot of betrayal and dishonesty and resentment. And we have to fix this years of this is what we typically tend to see that after that five year mark that's when we see a lot of couples coming in and they're like oh i need the help oh okay probably should have addressed that in the first year but of course we're not going to tell them that because we never want to play back on what it is that you should have done right. a lot of, that's not my that's not my approach i don't do that so yeah i do believe therapy for anybody mm -hmm. or anybody gets in a relationship try it out go to therapy just try therapy. that you are really whole, that you are truly, you know, living in your oneness and that you have established that self, that selflessness, because you're going to need that in a relationship. It takes a lot of selflessness and forgiveness. So in therapy, you can forgive yourself and the people who hurt you in the past. Yeah, that's so, that's so true. It's mm -hmm. very important that you do that self work. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important that you identify your patterns, like you identify all that stuff. And, you know, the world of dating is changing. So you really have to get very in tune with yourself yes. moving yes. forward. You got you got to do it. You got to do it. Well, what are your, um, so speaking of the world of dating, like kind of shifting and changing, we're in 2021 now. And we like are still in the midst of a pandemic. Like I just want people to know we are not out of the panorama quite yes. yet. <laughs> but uh, in, a pan in, in the panini, <laughs> I'm sure that people have been exploring online dating. What are your thoughts on online dating? 
And then like, what, how can people optimize their outcome on online dating? When we say online dating, we're not talking about social media dating. We're just talking about the dating sites. Or are we including social media dating? Girl, whatever you want. So I'm thinking Bumble, Tinder, like that area, but also people be hitting people up on LinkedIn. So we don't know. Online dating can mean a whole lot of stuff <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I feel like, oh man. Okay, I'm going to break these two apart. I don't want to uh, mix social media dating with online dating. I am completely against online dating. Okay. <gasps> Go ahead. I'm, I, I feel like I need to take a sip of my wine off this one. <laughs> I'm completely against online dating because I do feel like we live in a fast paced society now, right? Mm-hmm. And we want to keep up the speed. But on online dating, this person, it's easier for them to portray to be something, okay? Ooh. It's easier for them to portray to be something, okay? All they have to do is put in a bio and it's believable. And then you talk and you could be talking to a monster. You could be talking to Prince Charming right here on the screen, but it could be a monster behind closed doors. And that can work within social media dating as well. But I do feel like with those type of dating apps and then the simple fact that these people are not just dating you, they're dating multiple, 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 person after person after person after person, okay? And you have to be, your mental capacity needs to be high to be able to function within this online dating world, okay? You have to be prepared for that and and be mature to understand that this may not be the person. It is tacky to me. I feel like it's better for people to go out and get to know people. I feel like it's better for you to go out, socialize with people and learn how people are in their true form and not the computer form, not this smoke screen. Because I can portray to be this complete, honest woman. I can portray to be this woman that's stable, have all of my things together behind the screen. And then you meet me and my attitude and my personality and my my expressions, my countenance, all of that is not the same person that you met over the phone, okay? And I'm only saying it's for dating apps like Tinder and stuff like that. Now, social media dating, I'm with that. And the reason why I am is because a lot of people show their personal life. IG, not so much, but you can go back and track a person to Facebook. You can go back and track a person to IG, to TikTok, to Snap. You can track them and you can see that this is this true person in their element, in their true form. You can look back to years and years and go into memories and say, okay, this is how they handled this. This is how they handled this relationship. This is how they display themselves. You can see all of that. Mm -hmm. So yes. Online dating, I'm not with it. I know some people actually like it. If they have to, I just kind of have to map them through that. But I'm completely against it. I don't advise it. Probably shouldn't say that, but I just don't. I know that's a, that's a personal thing, but I just, I don't. I'll leave that one. I, I'm good on online dating too. You Did you see Clickbait on Netflix? No. Oh. Okay, honey, well... But pretty much the premise of it was this secretary was making fake online dating profile accounts for this guy. And she made like several on several different dating websites, done changed his name, done had like four, five, six different relationships, honey. So like when you were talking about people pretending behind a screen that's all that was going through my mind and then what also was going through my mind like on a more serious note there's a lot of dating experts that kind of advise with narcissistic people in mind um that persona is real baby it really is. So like, if you're the type of person who enjoys online dating, like we're not, we're not condemning you by any means necessary. Yeah. However, be careful, be careful. Cause these people really do be out here. Like, and it is people out here creating fake profiles and doing stuff like that. I can tell you um, from just, you know, some, some people that I have talked to in the past and stuff, especially men that I've talked to in the past uh, when men The male that I know, and this is not every man, but the men that I do know who have been open about what they do, they're like, oh, we just use the online just for sex. Like, this is recreational. I've heard that too. Yeah, they see it's it's kind of like this this hunting uh, strategy in a way. They see these women as vulnerable, as desperate that are on these dating sites. It's like, 
we can talk a good game to them, get them out, have sex with them. We don't have to deal with them. They don't know anything about us. We can pretend to be this person. Mm -hmm. And this is based off of people that I know, listening to conversations, sitting with a group of women and men over and over countless times, going to events and listening to them. And that's how a lot of people portray it. It's recreational. It's quick. I know a lot of people who have gone on these sites and utilize dating sites as typical sex sites, actually. The hookup site, especially in this hookup culture, is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yep. Girl, that's that's such an interesting perspective and and also interesting nuance to bring to the table, you know, just as a cautionary tale, y'all. If y'all out here online dating, do your thing, boo, but just be careful. Be be careful with anything that you're doing in terms of dating. Um, because these people be wilding out here. I'm not even gonna hold you. Okay, they be wilding, they be wilding. So Aside from the online dating and the narcissistic uh, tendencies on online dating and all the cray cray people that be on there, <laughs> I'm sure everyone is wondering how do we attract securely attached and healed people and build healthy long term relationships uh, moving forward? I love this conversation. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have this approach called it's and it's. It's basically attracting your, well, yes, attracting your soul mate by releasing your soul signal, okay? So you have an ego mate and you have a soul mate, okay? This is my approach. Because <laughs> okay. my mind is blown. Wait a minute. Oh, I'm really big. When you want to attract your soul mate, uh -huh. you have to make sure that your soul is operating as it should. Okay. And when I say this, if you are typically a happy, bubbly person and you haven't been that person, you've been this sad, broken person, you're going to attract an ego mate because you're going Ooh. to be familiar. What's familiar to you right now is pain and trauma and dismay. That's what's familiar. So you're blocking your soul signal from reaching your soul mate because it's constantly going towards your ego mate, which is here to sit here and say, in your mind, your ego is your mind at the end of the day. This is what you know, okay? So your body is functioning off of that. I know that I have these childhood traumas. Mm -hmm. So I can identify to this person that has either a similar trauma or their own traumas. That's what I'm attracting. But once I take that time, to really put inside, to feed my soul and get back to the foundation that I once had to become this happy person, to be the person that I usually am, to become one with myself. Once I know who I am again and I am instilling and I am building up my self-worth and I am loving myself and I'm being compassionate about myself, I am building up my self-compassion. I'm doing exercises to tell myself that I love you. I'm placing these positive aspects and these positive tokens into myself. Then I can unblock my soul to reach my soul mate. So until you are healed within yourself and you have utilized all of these self-love, self-healing, self-compassionate exercises to get you back to that happy, peaceful person, that happy, peaceful soul, the happy spirit that you once were, you're going to continue to attract this ego mate, which is not going to be good for you. You don't need to be with what's familiar. You need to be with to what's destined for you. Okay. And your soul mate is destined for you. And I know a lot of people say, oh, they're soul mates and twin flames. Yes, but that true person who connects with your soul, who brings harmony into your life is your soulmate. And you can't have a disharmonious life and expect for you to get to your soulmate. It's going to attract what's familiar. So if you're familiar with a narcissistic person over and over and over again, say, take some time to reevaluate what it is that you are attracting. What are you? Are you broken? You're going to attract a narcissist. Are you vulnerable right now? because you're hurting, you're going to attract that narcissist. People love to talk about narcissistic people. You are attracting who you are in this present moment. You are a weak individual. So guess who you are attracting? Weak individuals. You are insecure. So guess who you are attracting? Insecure people. Your emotional maturity is low. So guess who you are attracting? Emotionally unstable and immature people. Once you get to that place to where you have created that foundation, 
I am mentally mature. I am mentally, emotionally, you know, stable. I am at this place. I'm happy. I'm thriving. I'm loving myself. I'm living a fulfilling life. Guess what you're going to attract? Now your soul is reaching out for harmony. It has released that soul signal and it's telling you now I'm ready for my soulmate because I am one, I am whole now. I think I broke that down the best. I'm gearing to take off running in this room right now. I'm about to take off running because it was ego mate versus soul. Girl. If we don't do some content on that tomorrow, <laughs> ego mate versus soulmate. <laughs> That's the easiest way that I can break that down. So when I have people who come to me and tell me, you know, Kitty, I'm hurting right now. I want to love. I want that companionship. I want my love story. I will break them down and be like, mm, I see why you can't get it. Because a lot of these people are broken from a failed relationship. And they don't know who they are. They come out of these relationships and they've lost themselves. Their identity is that relationship. Mm. It's like, you can't release that soul signal because your life is chaotic right now. You have no harmony within yourself. You have no peace within yourself. It's chaos in your life. That nervous system is dysregulated. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So that's what we typically tend to do. And I had to realize I did that stuff. My, I did that to myself as well. Same. The whole time I kept saying, why do I keep attracting these people? And I realized, girl, you keep attracting all these broken people with low self-esteem and insecurities because this is exactly who you are. And yet this whole time you're believing that you just have everything together, but you don't. So, yeah. <laughs> Girl. And see, this is a whole nother conversation for another day, but like <laughs> usually when you are, when you're attracting those things, you're also in your wounded feminine as well. Yes. And until you learn what like that wounded feminine is versus, you know, your empowered feminine, until you learn what the difference between light feminine and dark feminine is like, baby, you will be out here sitting here thinking that like all this stuff and stuff is happening to you and that you do not have an active participant role in what's happening. Yes. Yes. Divine femininity. I love it. Once you operate in true, divine, healthy femininity, oh my God, that feminine energy is just something else. It's, it's powerful. It screams confidence. It screams sensuality. It screams love. It screams security. I know exactly who I am. That's attractive. That's attractive. That's that. It, it just screams invitation to an extent like I am inviting you all to experience me to understand that I am an experience and that for you to be able to have this experience okay this is not something that can be given to everybody mm -hmm. okay that's what that's divine femininity to me and I love that whenever I have women come to me to help them with their sensuality. It's like, I'm tapping into your senses. Your senses, baby, I'm about to bring that feminine energy. Oh, you about to thrive in here, baby. Look, what I'm saying is when you tap into that feminine, okay. things start to take off. Like it's a whole nother level you can tap into. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's Ooh, I love it because it just, it screams that I know who I am and I love who I am. Yeah. And nothing you can take away from me because I built this and I am standing on this. This aura that you are getting to experience is my feminine energy, okay? And once you as women, once we operate in that feminine energy and those men or those companions that we have that start gravitating to us, they appreciate that more because they understand that this is a once in a lifetime chance that I'm gonna be able to get with this woman. And that allows them to be able to let their guards down. But you know, I ain't gonna tap it too much. That the tea is, the tea is everybody's attracted to the feminine. Like everyone has an attraction to that feminine energy, whether you are, you know, in a heterosexual relationship, same sex relationship, any type of relationship, we all have, we mm -hmm. all have this innate understanding mm -hmm. of the power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of feminine energy and that's just it just is what it is like you know what it is when it hit the dough baby I was waiting for you at the dough period so talking about that feminine energy honey a lot of that feminine energy has a lot to do with how you celebrate yourself so how do you celebrate yourself my love 
oh, how do I celebrate myself? You know, I've never been asked that question. That's actually a really good one right there. I, <laughs> I want to make sure that I give you the best, the right answer, but I'm just going to give you the best answer that I can. I celebrate my accomplishments. I celebrate, and it's not just physical accomplishments. If I get up, let's just say, um, how can I say this? If I have conquered a stress, I celebrate that, okay? I affirm myself, mm -hmm. okay? I treat myself, okay? I use positive self-talk. That's how I celebrate myself. Any type of accompli accomplishments that it may be, whether it may be a stress or it may be um, a new stage that I have transitioned into on my healing journey or a new stage that I have transitioned to on my own personal self journey. I celebrate myself by dating myself, by loving myself, by doing for myself, by honoring myself. I speak life into myself. That's how I celebrate myself. I also celebrate myself by giving to other people, by complimenting other people. That's a celebration in my own. That's a selfless act and that's celebrating my glory as well. So I think that's the easiest way I can say it. I don't know, I'm a pretty humble, modest person, so. I don't do too much, but that's the best, those are the best ways that I can really say that I celebrate myself. That's the thing. Celebrating yourself like can be so many things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be like a public display of celebration. It can be like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I folded my laundry up today. I'm about to go get me like something good to eat. Like it, it can be, it can be so many different things. And so that's why I always ask that question at the end of our you know, yeah. our conversations here, because it's so important to display all the ways that we as women, we celebrate ourselves. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it, I mean, thank you for sharing how you celebrate yourself. Somebody yeah. out there is going to be like, you know what, I'm gonna try that, the thing that Kitty Rose said to do. I'm gonna try that. Talk is the biggest way to celebrate yourself. If you mm -hmm. did you tell yourself, you know what, I, I did that. I did that. I'm proud of me. When you go out there, you do something for yourself. You speak life into yourself mm -hmm. on your back. You did it. Those words of affirmation, those mm -hmm. words of affirmation just hit different. They really, really do. They I really do. do. I do. They really do. Especially when the words of affirmation that you are giving to yourself, to your heart. It's like, you know what? I appreciate myself for at least trying. At least I know that I did this. That's big. You know? That's huge. That's huge. And you know what, Kitty, I appreciate you so much for jumping on to the Healed podcast today. This was an amazing conversation and I would love to have more conversations with you about the feminine energy specifically. So, you know, y'all let us know if that's something that you want to hear. But in the meantime, Kitty, let us know where we can find you on social media, your website, all that good stuff. Yes, ma'am. So you can find me on IG at Pretty KJ Rose. That's IG at Pretty KJ Rose. You can find me on TikTok at Kitty J Rose. That's TikTok, Kitty J Rose. Or you can view me on my website, www.talktomekitty.com. That's www.talktomekitty.com to me kitty.com and you can find out how to book a session with me how to have a consultation if you are a woman who wants to establish or practice the art of sensuality you can do so there remember i teach relationships and intimacy as well so if you're a couple who needs help with intercourse or outer course i can walk you through it or women who want to explore certain things i can help with that as well i have many services to offer <laughs> I love that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Also, I do want to say this for anyone who is on their healing journey. We do have virtual and in-person healing workshops that we'll be doing throughout the United States. And right now we're starting off in Dallas on the 13th and the 20th. It is a two-part healing workshop. It is a pain and trauma release healing workshop. And that's on my website as well. If everyone wants to join and you can meet me in Dallas on the 6th of November from 12 to 5, Dallas, Texas. And we'll have the location up soon. So all of that is on my website, www.talktomekitty.com. <laughs> Big purr. Big purr. So if y'all, you know, if y'all are not already following Kitty, go ahead and skip on over to her page so you can learn some good information. Speaking of following, if you are not following the Hilt podcast on Instagram, what are you doing, sis? Come on. The Hilt podcast on Instagram, go ahead and follow that account and also sign up for our email list so you can stay updated for when we drop these amazing episodes with these amazing people 
on our podcast. As always, beautiful ladies. And you know what? You know, it ain't just the ladies that's listening to us. Y'all, y'all amazing people. Stay awesome and stay healing. I love you.